All right, good morning. Um, my name is Eric Alexander. I have the honor and privilege of uh, being the moderator uh, of a great talk today on behalf of THANK and in particular Tyro and to welcome you all in this uh, holiday season in uh, early middle December. So um, it's my <laughs> pleasure to introduce a, a great speaker um, and a former colleague before she moved away from my institution, Tammy Holm. And so um, a brief introduction, our lecture her today, a lecture today will be uh, Dr. Tammy Holm, and she's going to speak here, as you can see, on uh, disparities in treatment for differentiated thyroid cancer. Dr. Holmes, an endocrine surgeon. She's also an associate professor at the University of Cincinnati. Her MD and PhD is from Johns Hopkins and then surgical training here at the Brigham and Women's and the Mass General Hospital, including a fellowship uh, in endocrine uh, oncology. Currently, she has a lab that works on autophagy and thyroid cancer biology, dedifferentiation, also runs clinical research and trials ongoing as well related to thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal disease. Uh, but very excited to hear the talk here on this very important topic. Tammy, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your screens, and we'll welcome questions and answers here at the end. So good morning, um, and thank you for the <laughs> kind introduction and the privilege of speaking with you today regarding disparities in the care and management of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. It really is an honor to have the opportunity and platform to talk about uh, such an important topic. I have no disclosures. So I think that this topic is particularly meaningful um, because even though the word disparity is defined by differences and inequality, the study and understanding of disparities really reminds us to come together. And so the objectives for today's talk are really to recognize and define and describe disparities in the care and management of cancer patients, and then to dig a little deeper to examine and review some of the known disparities specific to differentiated thyroid cancer patients and then consider where we can improve and what are possible paths forward. So the National Cancer Institute defines cancer disparities as avoidable adverse differences in cancer measures. So things like the number of new cases, um, deaths, uh, cancer-related health complications, quality of life, and et cetera, that exist among certain population groups. Um, so which are the population groups um, that experience cancer health disparities? So typically, these are going to include folks that belong to different ancestry, race, or ethnicity, um, people from socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, uh, the uninsured or underinsured patients, those residents who live in rural um, or underserved rural areas, sexual and gender minorities, um, certainly certain immigrants or refugees or asylum seekers, uh, individuals with disabilities, adolescents and children, and the elderly are folks considered over the age of 65. One important factor to consider when we're thinking about these different population groups is to remember that many folks carry an even higher burden uh, because they fall into more than one category. Um, and adverse differences in cancer incidence and death rates, as well as differences in standard of care amongst these at-risk populations are certainly concerning. So why is this important beyond the obvious? Well, these at-risk groups are a huge part of our community and we have a responsibility to ensure that we are taking care of each other. So 40% of Americans self-identify as non-white, 34% are uninsured or underinsured, 19% live in rural or underserved areas, and it's projected by 2040 that almost a quarter of our population will be over 65. The numbers quote about 3.8% of our population are LGBTQ plus self-identified, but we expect that that number is even larger. And certainly again, this poses a significant public health challenge. So looking um, simply within racial and ethnic subgroups, we see rather stark differences. Um, some, this is some data that was adapted from the um, AACR Cancer Disparities Progress Report. And what we can see here on the figure on the left is that uh, the American Indian and Alaska Native populations has an 80% higher incidence in the rate of kidney cancer, where Asian populations have higher incidence of cancers caused by infectious agents. Black, the black population has more than double the mortality rate um, for multiple myeloma alone. And the Hispanic population has more than double the mortality for the rate of liver cancer. The native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander population has nearly three times the mortality rate from stomach cancer. And then beyond these racial and ethnic differences, we also see significant disparities with respect to people from lower socioeconomic or low education backgrounds, sexual and gender minorities, as well as those living in underserved or rural areas. 
50% higher mortality from stomach cancer for individuals, all individuals living under persistent poverty. And then noting in terms of screening that almost 60% of folks that are transitioning from female to male are not going to adhere to cervical cancer screening. And we can see uh, that because many of these people exist in multiple categories, the problem continues to grow. So for example, we know that black patients that present with cancers at a later stage of diagnosis when compared to their white counterparts. But we also know that black patients have lower stage specific survival for most cancers as compared to white patients. And what that means is that the increase in mortality cannot be wholly attributed to later stage of diagnosis. And this is kind of highlighted in this Washington Post article, which describes two studies from JAMA this past year, which demonstrate how gaps in health outcomes affect our population here in the United States. And they frame it in really rather staggering numbers. So Dr. Uh, Krumholz and colleagues use CDC prevention data to calculate the age-adjusted excess mortality rates between the black and white population and found that over a 22-year period, there was a loss of more than 80 million years, which is just staggering, of potential life that could have been preserved if the gap between black and white mortality rates alone was eliminated. So that's 1.6 million excess de deaths as compared to the white population. And when we nail it down specifically to cancer, uh, Zhao and colleagues looked at uh, recent national uh, cancer death and life expectancy data, and they found that when they looked at that data together with annual median earnings, they calculated that person years of life lost and found that for cancer patients, there's an estimated loss of $3.2 billion in premature uh uh, in earnings from premature cancer deaths just in 2015 alone. And so that really puts kind of in stark view like how these differences are reflected in our society. So how did we get here? Um, it's complicated. <laughs> Health is influenced by a variety of factors. Um, so genetics and behavior, environment and physical influences, medical care and social factors, and all of these things are interconnected. So what are social determinants of health? Uh, it's something that we've been talking about a lot more um, in health services research in the last decades. So defined by the CDC, social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. So it's defined as conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. And all of this within the context of a wider set of forces and systems that shape our daily lives. So when we think about socioeconomic factors, which we think contribute approximately 40%, we're really talking about money, power, and resources that are available. So things like jobs and education, family and social support, our community safety network. When we're thinking about physical environment, we're really talking about air and water quality. And then health behaviors are things like smoking, diet and exercise, alcohol use, et cetera. And then healthcare um, is really about access to care and care uh, quality. And of course, in the United States, I think it is important um, to mention and to discuss that we do have a long history of racial, uh, structural ra racism and systemic inequities, and that these factors also contribute to these differences in social determinants of health for uh, racial and ethnic minorities, in addition to other medically underserved populations. So collectively, all of these forces are contributing to cancer health disparities with respect to development, risk reduction, treatment, and survivorship of cancer patients. So of course, the focus of our talk is really to talk about uh, thyroid cancer. And the question becomes, well, does this matter for thyroid cancer? It is generally considered indolent. Uh, the majority of patients with differentiated, localized, and regional disease have excellent relative five-year survival. And this observation has unfortunately led many very well-meaning providers and sometimes even patients to proclaim that they have a good cancer. And of course, this is problematic for many reasons, but most especially because no one is lucky to have any type of cancer. And thyroid cancer is cancer. There are consequences to disease. In the United States, there are more than 950,000, so almost a million people living with thyroid cancer right now. Multiple studies have demonstrated that thyroid cancer has the highest degree of financial burden, 
with survivors having one of the highest bankruptcy rates of all cancer types. There was a study that showed that out-of-pocket costs for initial thyroid cancer diagnosis alone, just the initial diagnosis part, uh, can be upwards of $17,000. Um, and then when you consider that thyroid cancer tends to be diagnosed in a younger population with significantly longer quality adjusted life years, the overall financial burden, not to mention all of the intangibles associated with a cancer diagnosis, including stress and anxiety, and just the label of being a cancer patient has a significant toll. While the overall incidence of thyroid cancer has started to level off in the past several years, it's also important to recognize that there is, has been a small but significant increase in more aggressive thyroid cancers and mortality over the past several decades. And so taken together, given the significant prevalence of thyroid cancer and the potentials for financial toxicity, the increased bur burden on health disparity populations is definitely concerning. So uh, disparities in thyroid cancer, multiple studies, and this is not an exhaustive list, um, but just kind of a snapshot of some of the studies, um, have demonstrated disparities with respect to diagnosis, care, and management in patients with thyroid cancer. So Black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander patients present with more advanced disease, and this is well described, and they are less likely to receive radioactive iodine or undergo continued surveillance. So they're receiving suboptimal treatment. Um, as compared to white patients, black and Hispanic patients are more likely to be treated by low volume thyroid surgeons. And this has an effect on post-operative complications and mortality, excuse me. Black patients have a 23% higher risk of mortality compared to white patients. And similar work um, has been uh, demonstrated for patients um, with low education or low socioeconomic backgrounds that are similarly at risk for delays in diagnosis and treatment leading to worse outcomes. And then we also see that guideline concordant care segregates by race, socioeconomic status, and education. On top of all of this, and adding a new dimension to our understanding of cancer survivorship, we also know that cancer-related worry and overestimations of recurrence and mortality also associate with low education and Hispanic or Asian ethnicity. And certainly this cancer anxiety can have profound effects on quality of life. So again, this is not an exhaustive or complete list by any means, but all of this work in thyroid cancer disparities as a whole clearly names these at-risk populations and describes their outcomes from the standpoint of initial diagnosis to treatment and aftercare. This was a really nice study uh, published in surgery recently by Dr. Quo and colleagues. And they were looking to assess both the individual and cumulative impacts of social determinants of health, specifically looking at low income and low education, as well as non-insured and underinsured on mortality and time to treatment. So it was a retrospective analysis using um, the National, Cash National Cancer Database. And what's of significant concern here was the observation that the burden of adverse social determinants of health, as I described, is not equivalent across racial groups. So what does that mean? That means that white patients with three adverse social determinants of health, again, low education, low income, and no insurance, had a similar time to treatment as Black and Hispanic patients with only one adverse social determinant of health. So, and then on the flip side of that, while black and Hispanic patients with three adverse social determinants of health receive treatment significantly later than their white counterparts, and patients in the lowest income quartile then had a 37% higher mortality risk as compared to the highest income quartile, even after controlling for comorbidities and stage of disease. And then finally, what was concerning and remains concerning is that controlling for clinical factors that impact mortality, Black patients still had have a 14% higher risk of overall mortality and increased odds of in-hospital stay. Looking at this even further, this is another NCDB study um, published in Thyroid this past summer, and the authors wanted to identify patient factors that associated with the greatest risk for delays in presentation and surgical treatment of thyroid cancer. So they identified patients that were receiving their initial diagnosis of thyroid cancer and looked to see which patients were more likely to undergo surgery more than 90 days from diagnosis. 
And why 90 days is because previous work has demonstrated that the time to surgery, if it's more than 90 days, um, it increases the hazard ratio for overall mortality by about 30%. And what these authors found was that non-white patients or patients that were uninsured or with public insurance were more likely to undergo surgery more than 90 days from diagnosis. And these same subgroups also uh, presented with higher stages at diagnosis and were more likely to have larger tumors and distant metastasis. Now, the reasons for this delay remain to be determined and are likely multifactorial and certainly a, a, a source of ongoing research. But again, identifying the problem is certainly the first step to fixing it. So clearly identifying patient factors that associate with adverse outcomes is incredibly important. And one area that has come to the forefront in the past few years that has been particularly important to me on a more personal level is this monolithic Asian myth. Um, so I'm Asian. <laughs> in fact, I'm half Asian, although I'm often perceived as full, though typically my country of origin is misconstrued. And I'm old enough or young enough to remember uh, coming to this country as a child and filling out those little bubble sheets uh, for race and ethnicity, um, you know, when you took standardized testing and all of this, and never really knowing exactly how I was supposed to fill it out, you know, how to recognize both sides of myself, and then, you know, which one was accurate. And at that time, you could only fill out one bubble. And so I've been really excited about some of the work looking to better categorize the Asian population, because clearly, Asian Americans are not a singular group. We, there are a lot of distinct uh, ethnic subgroups groups with um, different socioeconomic backgrounds, cultures, and languages. Um, and importantly, in the United States, uh, it's 8% of the population. Uh, 22 million people um, are of Asian origin, 1.5 million people of Pacific Islanders, and we are the fastest growing population in the United States. So this was a really intriguing study published recently in the Annals of Epidemiology um, this past, last year. And these authors assessed data from FEAR and used it to compare age-adjusted incidence rates of thyroid cancer for seven distinct Asian and Pacific Islander subgroups, which included Indian Pakistani, Chinese, Filipino, Hawaiian, uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese. And they compared this to non the non-Hispanic white population. And what they found was clear differences in age-adjusted incidence of thyroid cancer amongst Filipino patients with both men and women having a significantly higher incidence as compared to non-Hispanic white men and women. And initially, um, these authors had hypothesized that the increase in, in thyroid cancer incidence amongst the Filipino population could potentially be attributed to overdiagnosis. Um, but in fact, this is not what they found. They took their, their study to the next level and they used California Cancer Registry uh, data to assess case distribution by sex, age at diagnosis, TNM stage, pathology, and mortality. And they identified about 5,000 Filipino patients and found that adjusting for sex, age at diagnosis, and socioeconomic status, Filipino patients had more advanced disease at diagnosis as compared to non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, and some Asian subgroups. Moreover, the authors found that Filipino ethnicity remained a significant independent variable for mortality risk from thyroid cancer as compared to these same subgroups. So certainly much more work to be done, but it's important and you know, definitely reassuring that we're starting to look more closely at what it means to be Asian in America and certainly an Asian cancer patient in the United States. Now, I do want to pivot a little bit to talk about the messaging of thyroid cancer because I think it can be a little bit confusing. And there's a lot of focus on uh, the indolent nature of disease, you know, kind of as I talked about earlier. And especially in the last decade, there's been a lot of discussion and reporting, both in the medical literature and in the media, about overdiagnosis. So overdiagnosis referring to the, to the diagnosis of a condition that otherwise would not have caused symptoms or death. And as specialists, we are talking a lot about de-escalating care for patients with thyroid cancer. And I think that hearing and seeing those snippets of conversation can be a bit we'd bewildering both to patients and providers who may not be wholly focused on the care and management of thyroid cancer patients. And so let's just take a quick step back, um, perhaps to, to the start of it, 
Um, so starting in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a surge in the incidence of thyroid cancer, and this was true worldwide. And as this epidemic of thyroid cancer, as it was described, was reported on in a variety of different ways, it may have induced a bit of panic as nations considered how this kind of onslaught of thyroid cancer patients would be managed. And this really uh, thoughtful group led by Dr. Davies at Dartmouth took a really good look at the data, and they started with an analysis um, that was somewhat provocative and controversial at the time of of the SEER database looking at cancer incidence and mortality. And what they found was that while the overall incidence of thyroid cancer began rising somewhat dramatically around 2003, mortality rate remained relatively stable over the entire 35 period. And so from this, they suggested that the majority of the rapid rise in the incidence of thyroid cancer could be attributed to overdiagnosis of small, clinically less concerning thyroid cancers as opposed to more aggressive subtypes. So as many groups started to recognize the potential for overdiagnosis in thyroid cancer, another really important question emerged. Um, and one of them, and it was, is overdiagnosis equally distributed? This was a really important study published by Dr. Marcatus and colleagues a few years ago in JNCI. And they were looking at the contribution of overdiagnosis to observed racial disparities in breast and thyroid cancer. So again, using SEER data, they compared non-Hispanic black and white patients over a 22 year period. And this figure on the left taken from the paper found that when they looked at the absolute incidence of thyroid cancer, um, they found white patients were more likely to be diagnosed as compared to black patients. However, uh, black patients were more likely to, uh, to be diagnosed uh, or, and present with distant as opposed to localized or regional disease. And then they did something really interesting, which is they drilled down a bit further. And you can see that on the figure here on the right. And they segregated tumors based upon size. And what they we can see is that while the overall incidence of papillary thyroid cancer is higher in non-Hispanic white patients, a much greater proportion of these patients, about two thirds, have tumors that are less than two centimeters in size. Whereas in the black population, the reverse is true, where about 60% of the black population presented with tumors greater than two centimeters in size. And then diving even further into these discrepancies or differences um, in diagnosis, there was a really interesting study um, evaluating gender inequity in thyroid cancer diagnosis by uh, doctors De uh, LeClaire and Davies in 2021. And what they wanted to look at was variations in thyroid cancer risk by sex. So they looked at sex-specific thyroid cancer rates in the United States um, and compared that to the prevalence of subclinical thyroid cancer um, looking using autopsy data of men and women. So in this figure taken from their paper, they look at detection rates by sex when analyzed by size. And what we can see is that the biggest discrepancy is for small papillary thyroid cancers, less than two centimeters, where we have a four to one uh, incidence rate in women as compared to men. And what we can see as we look at some types of thyroid cancer, that as the relative lethality of cancer increases, the ratio by sex approaches one. And then this is another figure of their paper, which basically summarizes their meta-analysis um, and essentially shows that the prevalence of subclinical uh, thyroid cancer at autopsy of men and women is uh, insignificant. It's exactly, it's, it's the same. Now, many investigators over the years have spent a considerable amount of time trying to understand the why behind this discrepancies between men and women with respect to thyroid cancer. And it's been an area of intense research looking for relationships between estrogen and estrogen light compounds and other hormonal links that it could explain why thyroid cancer is identified more frequently in women because it's an observation that's been pretty common for a very long time. And thus far, really a, a, a convincing link um, has not been demonstrated. Certainly, we can think about uh, non-biologic forces, which may be contributing to the observation uh, that thyroid cancer is more common in women, and it may relate to increased utilization of care, and in fact, be in part driven by our own bias about thyroid cancer in women, this notion that the more you look, the more you're going to find. With that in mind, I do think it is important to highlight this relatively recent paper uh, that was published by Dr. Ortovsky and colleagues, They uh, because they their findings kind of encourage us to think about sex differences in thyroid cancer in a little bit of a new way. Um, they performed a pretty exhaustive analysis of epidemiologic studies um, in differentiated thyroid cancer, trying to identify clinically meaningful differences in outcomes related to sex. And in some, they did report that the results are somewhat inconsistent, but they did uh, highlight 
that there may be important differences when considering reproductive age. And two studies in particular, one was a large retrospective study using National Thyroid Cancer Treatment Cooperative Study Group Registry data. Um, and another was a SEER uh, database uh, study. And what they identify here was that there were differences in disease specific mortality between men and women um, that appeared to segregate um, adjusted for stage when you looked at uh, what was likely premenopausal women under the age of 55 as compared to men. Um, and we see, again, slightly improved uh, disease specific survival in these premenopausal women stage matched. Um, and then we note that after 55, these discrepancies uh, resolved. Uh, towards that end, um, in considering potential molecular forces that are driving these differences, there was a recent study uh, published in clinical otolaryngology a few months ago that looked at mutational rates amongst men and women um, further uh, segregated by age. And what they found, again, was that the overall rate of mutations was similar between men and women. And similar to other studies, they did note that point mutations were higher in younger patients um, and chart mutations were old, uh, more present in older patients. But what they found that was interesting was that tended to have concomitant BRAF chart mutations at older ages as compared to men who had BRAF chart mutations at significantly younger age. And then they asked the question whether this might be contributing to differences in um, disease-specific survival. So from this portion of our conversation, I think we've established that thyroid cancer care in general can be quite nuanced, um, where there is too much for some and not nearly enough for others. Um, I think that we've clearly identified Black and Hispanic patients, Filipino, and potentially other Asian Pacific Islander subgroups um, that remain to be studied, as well as patients from low socioeconomic backgrounds or with lower education as folks that are at higher risk for underdiagnosed and undertreatment. And then on the other side of the coin are patients who are being overtreated, which include white patients and women, particularly younger women. And I think that this is important to have the conversation uh, because of the nuance, regarding the nuance of thyroid cancer diagnosis and management, particularly as we think about patient provider interactions. Um, this was a really interesting paper by Dr. Hamart's group at Michigan, and they were looking at PCP interactions uh, with respect to both the diagnosis and treatment of thyroid cancer patients. And it was a really cool study because they looked at uh, two SEER registries in Georgia and Los Angeles County, and they identified a large, really diverse cohort of patients and providers uh, with newly diagnosed thyroid cancer over one year period. And then they surveyed the patients and the providers to assess the degree of primary care involvement in both the diagnosis and treatment. And what they found was that Black, Hispanic, and Asian patients were more likely to report that their primary care doctor informed them of their diagnosis. And really interestingly, Black, Asian, and elderly patients more frequently reported treatment discussions with their primary care doctors. Further kind of drilling down, they noted that uh, just over a quarter of primary care doctors read the ATA or NCAN guidelines with respect to management. And with in terms of comfort, only two thirds of primary care doctors felt comfortable discussing the diagnosis of thyroid cancer and less than half felt comfortable discussing thyroid cancer treatment with their patients. And I think this speaks to some of the nuance of uh, disease, but it also uh, is interesting because it presents opportunities um, for improving communication between specialists and primary care providers and also with our patients. Because it begs the question, could patient provider concordance with respect to race and ethnicity facilitate better outcomes too? And there's been a lot of work done looking at patient provider concordance and how that can affect uh, health outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little later in the talk. But I think that we as specialists, you know, here today can really think about how can we provide better guidance and access for primary care physicians um, with respect to current standards in the management of thyroid cancer patients? How can we be more available? Um, what are telehealth options? What are the different things that we can do to help facilitate uh, eliminating those barriers to care? And then looking even deeper into this communication between patients and the system as a whole, I thought this is a really interesting study by the same group um, and very thought-provoking paper, um, looking at how language acts uh, just at a very um, basic level can influence access to care. And so what they did was really cool. They, um, over one year period, they uh, performed an audit of about 144 hospitals located across 12 really demographically diverse states. They developed a standardized script um, and they trained investigators assigned to the roles of English speaking, Spanish speaking, and Mandarin speaking. And then they called the hospital and they said, 
let's see what happens when these patients try to access care um, in three specific sub uh, cancer subtypes that tend to proportionally impact Hispanic and Asian populations. And so the languages that they looked at um, were English, Spanish, and Mandarin. And they were asking about uh, uh, access to care for colon, lung, and thyroid cancer. And their findings um, were really, really interesting. So looking on the table on the left, again, taken from their paper, they found that English speaking patients um, and patients contacting teaching hospitals were more likely to prov be provided with next steps with respect to access to care. Um, but further broken down on the right, we see that while almost 94% of the time, almost 100% of the time, English speaking patients were provided the next steps, only 38% for Spanish speaking and 28% for Spanish speaking patients. So clearly this highlights, you know, just a, 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 at the most basic level an access to care disparity. And I think that barrier even goes beyond language itself. Um, this was a commentary that was really nicely written by a third year medical student um, who describes one of his experiences during clinical rotations. And I thought it was a really interesting paper to read because he describes a discussion with an interpreter after a patient interaction. And it really speaks to the fact that uh, pure language interpret interpretations can sometimes link, uh, limit patient-physician communication. And it describes how language interpretation itself is not necessarily a proxy for cultural understandings. And in this uh, commentary, the student is describing a situation where a Haitian patient um, is presenting to their primary care doctor um, to talk about uh, abdominal pain that was somewhat nonspecific. And they had an interpreter present and the interpreter very di diligently reported the conversation back and forth between the doctor and the patient. And at the end of the day, it was not entirely clear what was driving it. The primary care doctor had you know, done an exhaustive workup. The patient was still uncomfortable. They couldn't find a source from it. And in a casual conversation with the interpreter after the patient interaction, the medical student asked the interpreter and the interpreter put forth uh, an understanding of the patient relative to his the cultural context, which was that the, the hysterectomy that she'd previously had was contributing to her abdominal pain because from a cultural standpoint, folks uh, have a different interpretation of what it means to have surgery in, with respect to their overall body and how that feels. And it's really eye-opening because it tells us that even when language is not a barrier, that these differences in cultures and backgrounds can prevent mutual understanding. And while this is an important factor to highlight, and I, I wanna bring it up here to talk about, I think it's also important for us to remember that we have to be careful about our cultural competency um, in that we wanna recognize factors that can influence behavior and decision-making. But on the flip side, we have to be really careful too that we don't then succumb to stereotypes and make other assumptions about patient beliefs based on their backgrounds and nationalities. So both an informative and a cautionary tale. And again, clearly communication matters. And I think that when we think about communication between our patients and providers on multiple levels, we also have to remember that there are broad consequences when we can't communicate, not just in the initial care and management of patients, but in the bigger picture as well. And that's why I want to talk about clinical trial enrollment. And the figure on the left really highlights racial and ethnic disparities in clinical trial enrollment based on what would be expected based on US population data. And you can see clearly that a lot of racial and ethnic minority groups are underrepresented. And we have to ask ourselves too, how much of that could potentially be related to language because most consents are written in English. But, but I wanna also include this figure on the right um, because I wanna highlight a very interesting point, which is that when patients are asked to participate in clinical trials, when you are able to facilitate that communication, they do. Irrespective of race and ethnicity, this was a, a systematic review, a meta-analysis, and they looked, they talked to cancer patients, and they said when asked, irrespective of race and ethnicity, about 50% of patients will uh, consent to participate. You just have to remember to ask. And that this inclusion and diversification can be taken a step further. This is a, a paper um, from Trends in Cancer published last year by Dr. Halmai and colleagues. And they were looking at biologic differences in genetic ancestry and how that can be reflected in some of the databases that we use. So here, all the way on the left, we look at the U.S. racial and ethnic population and how that's divided up. And then what they looked at was how that fell with respect to um, the Cancer Genome Atlas. So the Cancer Genome Atlas, 77% um, of that data is from patients of European ancestry. 
So when we think about gastric cancer and we think about the expected patient population um, with gastric cancer with respect to race and ethnicity, there are stark differences in what those uh, distributions look like. And when we think about that and how we can model those changes, so it's important to make sure that we're remembering that with respect to biologic differences in genetic ancestry and how all groups can be appropriately represented. But I do want to make sure that we talk about some good news too, um, in that many new initiatives uh, provide a deep insight into both biologic factors and social determinants of health that contribute to health, uh, cancer health disparities. And there are a lot of projects ongoing from the National Institutes of Health. Um, the All of Us project has enrolled about 100,000 people. Um, half from underrepresented groups. And there's evidence to suggest that equitable access to high quality standard cancer care can eliminate disparities in several types of cancer, including thyroid cancer. And this was a recent study uh, looking at differences in lung cancer patients that were demonstrated um, with a multi-pronged investigation here um, that comprised patient navigation and real-time warning system to track patient care and race-specific uh, feedback to clinical teams on treatment completion rates. And they eliminated treatment disparities amongst Black and white patients with lung cancer, but also improved care for all patients regardless of race. So there are systems-based interventions that we can utilize that can help improve care for amongst our, our at-risk patients, but also amongst all patients um, with cancer. And specific to thyroid cancer, we know that this is possible for thyroid cancer too. And so this is a, uh, a study that was uh, published in surgery last year and then presented at the Academic Surgical Congress. And it was an interesting study. Uh, it was a retrospective analysis of about 200 patients treated with radioactive iodine at a high volume endocrine surgery center. And why I thought this was interesting was because when they looked at that, they found that um, almost uh, three quarters of the patients were operated on by high volume endocrine surgeons. And when they looked at the thoroughness of surgery as measured by thyroid bed remnant uptake on post-thyroidectomy radioactive iodine scans, um, they found that uh, there were no differences across racial and ethnic groups. And they also found that there were no differences in recurrence across racial and ethnic groups. So obviously, this is a small study and more, are, more work um, ought to be done. But it does suggest that when ethnic and racial minorities have similar access to quality surgical care, disparities might be mitigated to some extent. So... Moving forward, you know, what are the things that we do or we can do as providers? You know, so I think what brings us together as providers and physicians is a mission to provide the best care possible to all of our patients. And while we may disagree on some of the details, I do believe that the one truth amongst all of us is that we want to take care of people and we want to do it well with justice and with equity. And that's why we're here in medicine. And what are things that we could do to drive progress, um, recognize our own biases, uh, work to acknowledge what we do not know, um, and remain curious about our differences. Um, and that while position and provider diversity within treatment teams might be difficult at all times, I think sometimes we have to remember just to ask the questions. There's a great example um, of a dermatologist who um, was from the Pacific Northwest, Asian ancestry or Asian uh, ethnicity, and she was trying to treat um, psoriasis in a patient who, uh, with a, a topical hair washing treatment, she gave it to the patient, and the patient came back, and um, there wasn't any improvement in their psoriasis. And she asked them, "Oh, you know, have you been using this every day?" And the patient said, "Of course not." And that's when she learned that there are differences in hair washing. Um, amongst different populations and that amongst the black population, because of the nature of their hair and the delicacy of it, that they may not wash their hair every day. And so she wasn't using the treatment every day. And perhaps that was why there was a difference in outcome. So how we speak and understand to each other makes a, a, a big difference. And understanding that and that cultural understanding can really help us respond to patients' needs appropriately. That's not to say that we should not be increasing representation amongst providers and leadership because diversity does matter for health. Um, there's experimental evidence from Oakland. This was a Stanford University pairing 1,300 Black men um, in Oakland with either Black or non-Black doctors. Black physicians were more likely to engage patients that were um, then more likely to consent to preventative services. Um, and they found that with this intervention, there was an estimated almost 20% decrease in black white mortality gap due to heart disease. So we know that there are things that we can do. Um, but once again, this graphic on the right reminds me to talk about the fact that we don't have that workforce now. Um, right now, our workforce 
is about 56% white, 70% Asian, and 6% Hispanic, and 5% Black. And so our workforce is not going to catch up with our population quickly. But I think that introducing how we can push for everyone to be a good doctor and to do that, to recognize what we don't know, what we don't see, um, and we don't hear by asking um, both our friends, our colleagues, our circles, so that when we interact with our patients, we can continue to provide the best care in an equitable manner. Again, this includes inclusion and diversification across patient engagement for clinical trials, um, involvement in data collection and outreach. How can we engage our community leaders so that we can build teams that are more diverse so that while we are still working to catch up from a provider level and perhaps even the leadership level, that we can build teams now for folks that are interested, because there are many, in providing appropriate care for our at-risk groups. And then finally, of course, working to identify and remove barriers to care, finding ways to connect high-volume surgeons and centers that have appropriate endocrine and surgical expertise with patients in order to reduce health disparities. Again, we know that if we can put these folks together through inclusion and diversification um, and our conversations, we can better recognize important structural problems, things like lack of sick days amongst certain population groups, difficulties with transport, childcare, language, and culture, so that we can appropriately and effectively identify and remove uh, barriers to care. And again, I do want to make sure that we caution ourselves in these efforts, because as healthcare professionals, we do have to understand the difference between cultural understanding that helps us respond to patients' needs and concerns, but also our own implicit bias expressed in cultural terms um, that you know, may perpetuate uh, stereotypes or obscure our understanding. Um, and then finally, I do want to remind all of us that opportunities abound. Um, there is increased funding to eliminate cancer health-related disparities. So for those that are interested, um, there is a lot of work to be done, but there is also a lot of resources available for those that, that, that are passionate about it. For all of us to identify what we can do as providers and communities, as institutions, to bring about kind of that policy level of change. Um, and with that, I um, will take a hold for questions. Amy, thank you. That was an amazing, uh, amazing kind of discussion through the literature and so much um, data. I actually am optimistic the last day, the last decade has been really helpful in, in shedding more light uh, on the um, issues you describe. And that I think makes us all better physicians and hopefully it's healthcare at the end of the day that is improved. But thank you so much for um, such an informative talk. So I welcome everyone and anyone to put uh, questions into the chat. Um, and we do have one that I'll start with, Tammy, uh, and I'll read it actually. Um, acknowledging this was a very important discussion and very thought provoking. We'd all agree with that. Um, what is your opinion on advancement in care and early detection for thyroid cancer? in comparison to overdiagnosis for the rational, uh, rational of static temporal mortality trends? And additionally, to what extent does access to care explain this story of healthcare disparity and our patients of diverse backgrounds who have a primary care provider still being missed? Two a lot there. <laughs> um, I think those are very um, pertinent and important questions. I wanna bring it up in the chat so I can read it because I think that it is so important and make sure that we're, we're kind of addressing all of that. Advancement of care and early detection for thyroid cancer in comparison to overdiagnosis. I think that, that certainly, you know, there is a population that's being overdiagnosed. And I think that some of that comes from, again, the way that things are portrayed and the way that we receive information ends up being so black and white. Like there's, you know, epidemic, 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 we have to pay attention to thyroid cancer um, and cancer in general and making sure that early diagnosis, not necessarily um, spoken about uh, as thyroid cancer, but early diagnosis in general saves lives. And that's all true. But with respect to thyroid cancer, making sure that we have nuanced discussions with our patients and making sure that we get that information out there, not just to the patients, but to the providers. So that if they're not prepared to have that conversation, which makes sense because it is, you know, nuanced and talking about ongoing surveillance and what that means can be a very, you know, prolonged and, and I wouldn't say difficult, but uh, nuanced discussion with patients. And I think that availability matters. So are there ways that we can connect providers with specialists so we can have these conversations behind the scenes? Um, and then potentially then connect those specialists to the patients. I mean, the one good thing about the pandemic is, is that it has offered multiple opportunities for telehealth and care and, you know, how we can talk to patients in that way. 
And then from another institutional level, one thing that I think will be really interesting is they, as we think about, um, it's a little bit separate, but talking about libraries, because access to care matters, and certainly some of our more at-risk populations may not have access to um, the telehealth media that's necessary to have these conversations, but providing times at, you know, our, our community locations like libraries where people can get together then and maybe have a day where that's a subspecialist day at your local community library where you can go and access the telehealth resources necessary to have those conversations with a specialist to discuss how to detect it and whether or not that makes sense for you. And I think as part of that, we also have to learn about our different patient populations and what it means to them. So for some patients, uh, continued surveillance for low-risk cancers may have actually be an overburden and how can we figure out how to manage that effectively for that patient population and then while ensuring that we're also looking at their specific risks over time for missing something. So I think it's an important and ongoing question and kind of dicing things out between groups is going to be important and kind of identifying all of the details that will affect care for all of the different subgroups. Thank you, Tammy. And um you know, the data that you showed are so just strikingly real in terms of the disparities that are out there, also the um, complexity of how culture and other um, determinants of health really do impact end endpoints, hard endpoints of mortality and morbidity. Um, and the question always is, well, what do we do? And I know you got to, you got to some of those solutions and there's many individual um, steps that we each can take. And sometimes it's as much as simply taking the time to think about it yourself and ask yourself what you implicitly might have missed or not be doing that someone else is doing that can give you a new lens into it. But um, I wanted to kind of bring your thoughts into this. Uh, one of the ideas that has always struck me is that um, we each do bring our own lens at times and our own experiences to how we think about um, the culture, uh, other cultures, or we don't understand other cultures. And in that regard, increasingly, obviously, medicine is a team-based sport. There are so many providers that care for, um, for our patients together. And is there something there that we should be augmenting to improve a, as a means of operationalizing an improvement to this issue? Meaning, if we do work better as teams, if we are able to more explicitly each bring our insight um, to the care of an individual, would that make it better uh, and, and decrease some of those disparate, uh, uh, disparate outcomes? And I guess the question I have is, is there literature on that? Um, is there any other awareness that you might have in that regard? I think that's excellent. Um, and I completely agree. Uh, I think there is a uh developing literature regarding creating those multidisciplinary teams. And I think that it's actually very, very necessary because I agree with you, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And I, I kind of show the, the see no he evil, hear no evil, speak no evil as kind of a proxy for really, if you don't know about it, you don't know to ask. And if you didn't grow up in an environment where, you know, it was maybe difficult um, to get to a doctor's appointment or find childcare, or if you're not, you know, dealing with that sort of struggle, it's not going to be at the forefront of your mind. And you may not even consider it as a possibility because it's not something that you've experienced. And if you haven't experienced it, it might not be real enough to you. And I think part of part of that as providers is recognizing that, like recognizing the potential for not seeing um, or not hearing is really, really important in our interactions with patients. Um, so that's kind of more of at a provider level. Um, there's been data, you know, when we look at workforce data, we, we clearly know we're, we're at deficiencies in two spots. One is that we don't have enough representation, but that it's going to be a long time coming. And while there are aims to improve that, it's going to take a while to get everybody through medical school residency training. And there are even barriers to overcome getting to medical school residency and training. Yeah. And so people have started looking at, you know, well, how can, you know, teams help us now? And while the data is new, you know, I think from, from experience, when we talk about, when we talk to patients, especially patients that have made their way through, they're really excited about participating. And I think engaging patients and community members, um, you know, half of the time, uh, this is more for parathyroid patients, but, you know, I, I treat a lot of hyperparathyroid patients. And a lot of times it's just getting that one patient in, explaining what's going on. And then that patient goes back and talks to their community at church 
or, you know, in other social settings. And then suddenly you're seeing, you know, an entire cohort of people that are all interrelated in an interesting way. And I've seen that more and more uh, here in, in the greater Cincinnati area. And it, it's great, you know, and then those people, um, you know, I see them then come then into the office with various degrees of backgrounds in terms of their socioeconomics, in terms of uh, their education level, and in terms of language. And those other players end up acting as like the best advocates for talking about what to do, how to manage it, what to expect, all of those different things. And then identifying to me, like, what are the things that are in the way? Like, oh, yeah. you know, this patient's worried about X because they come together at appointments, which is really useful um, in terms of helping to kind of figure that out a little bit better. And I think that, you know, that's an exciting area of, of research that we should really pursue further. I think that's I think that's a wonderful summary almost to end on that each of us can take away from this. There are things we can all do better to just think about this in a broader way. We can also teach others around us. We can work with others around us in teams. And you even touched, though I know there's not time for it, on how maybe technology can help us to also um, improve the care of the many different groups that we all care for and we work together as one hopefully healthy society. So time is late. Um, I do want to, uh, I know there's going to be many more questions if we had the time, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time to also get to their other duties uh, here on this uh, Friday. So thank you, Tammy, for taking the time and walking us through that great talk and uh, <laughs> welcome everyone to uh, continue the discussion uh, in their own environment. So have a wonderful day, everyone.